Well, good morning, everyone. Um, for one reason or another, it's been, uh, it's been quite a week. And uh, also last night, it was the uh, boat race fundraising evening in the Crown. Um, although I managed to slip away at quarter to nine, um, I haven't had the usual preparation time that I, I usually have. Um, but we find ourselves today um, in a, a wonderful part of Mark's Gospel. And uh, it's, it's a real purple passage. And uh, for this sermon, I'm, I'm turning for practical reasons, but also I think it's good sometimes to hear other people's words, to uh, the wisdom of Tom Wright, uh, one of our greatest contemporary theologians. Um, his commentary on Mark, um, I'm drawing largely from this morning. Do recommend this series if you want to get more into your Bibles and your Bible study. Um, he's done a, Tom Wright has done a whole series. It's just called For Everyone. And it's in plain English, which is great. Um, very, very readable, but, but very, very um, searching as well in terms of kind of a, uncovering the original meaning of the scriptures. Um, so he's done one on every gospel. He's done pretty much the whole New Testament, I think. And he started on the Old Testament as well. So, Caesarea Philippi is where the action takes place today. And uh, it's quite a walk to Caesarea Philippi. Even in a car on modern roads, apparently, the trip takes uh, an hour or two, um, heading north from the Sea of Galilee, from the North Shore. It takes that long to drive to Caesarea Philippi. So imagine walking there. So Jesus is very deliberately taking his disciples away, way up north. Uh, he's taking them also up to a high place. It's on the slopes of Mount Hermon, and it's by the source of the River Jordan. So you can imagine them in this place, this high place, looking down pretty much the whole of the Jordan Valley towards Jerusalem. I liken it a little bit to, I don't know whether you've ever had that experience of driving over the, uh, the Pennines on the M62 particularly, or maybe you've been walking on the Pennine Way and, and you get that, you go over the top, this, over the summit, and you get this incredible view. Um, you see Oldham and then you see Manchester on a clear day you can see all the way to Liverpool. You can see the, the outlines of the cathedrals. Uh, the whole of the Mersey Valley lies in front of you. It's a bit like that, but it's with the Jordan Valley. So why is Jesus treating his friends to this view? Tom Wright says, we had better think hard about this because this passage really is the center point, the turning point in Mark's gospel. The passage itself is like a mountain slope, and it gives us a view. It gives us a view backward to all that we've experienced, all that we've been through as we've been traveling through Mark's gospel over the last weeks and months. But it gives us a, a view forward, just as it gave uh, Jesus' original disciples a view forward. It gives a view forward down that Jordan Valley to Jerusalem, where the final mission of Jesus the Messiah would take place. And Jesus asks his friends two questions. Who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And to the first question, they reply, well, some people say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say uh, another great prophet. And... Um, if you're at all familiar with the biographies of John the Baptist or Elijah or any of the great prophets, you know, we're not talking gentle Jesus, meek and mild. In fact, we've seen very little of that so far in Mark's gospel. These were, these were fearless men uh, standing up to injustice uh, and evil in their own situations. And that's, that's who people saw in Jesus. But then came that second question, who do you say that I am? And Peter, maybe for himself, but maybe for the whole group, 
declares, you are the Messiah. Now, what does that mean? It's vital for us to be clear about what that means. Calling Jesus Messiah doesn't mean calling him God, let alone the second person of the Trinity or anything like that. Yes, Mark does obviously believe that Jesus was and is divine, and he, he's going to eventually show us why. But at this moment in the gospel story, there's, there's something else going on. This is much more about uh, the politically dangerous and risky claim that Jesus is the true king of Israel. He is the final heir to the throne of David. He is the one before whom Herods, all the Herods, and all the rather shabby um, puppet kings and princelings of the time are just imposters. You see, the disciples at this point, they weren't, they weren't expecting a divine redeemer. They were simply longing for a king, and they thought that they had found one in Jesus. Now, the other significant um, detail about Caesarea Philippi is that there had just been, a, there had recently been built there a temple, a temple to the newest pagan god, i.e. the Roman emperor himself. So imagine Peter making this declaration to Jesus, you are the Messiah, you are the true king. Possibly even within earshot of this new temple, this temple to the, the Roman emperor. How, how, how much more politically um, provocative can you get? So as we look back at what we've been experiencing so far in Mark's Gospel, what have we seen? We've seen Jesus largely in prophetic mode, announcing the kingdom of God, announcing the long-awaited moment when God would rule Israel and ultimately the world. God would rule with justice and mercy, the justice and mercy which the scriptures had spoken and for which Israel had longed. All mere human rule, with its mixtures of justice and oppression, mercy and corruption, would fade before this new kingdom, this new rule. And what Jesus had been doing thus far, the healings, the battles with evil, the extraordinary feedings, the stilling of storms, and so on, they are all signs that this is indeed the moment when when the true God, the true ruler, is beginning to exercise his power. And the disciples have taken a step in their own understanding at this point. Jesus is not just announcing the kingdom. Jesus is the king. Now, by no means were all Jews at the time wanting or expecting a messiah. But those who did were clear that, that the Messiah had to do three different things. First of all, the, the Messiah had to rebuild or cleanse or somehow renew or refresh the temple. Secondly, the Messiah had to defeat the enemy that was threatening God's people. And thirdly, the Messiah was going to bring God's justice that rich, restoring, purging, healing power, both in Israel and then out into the world. The Messiah was going to be God's agent in bringing in a new kingdom, sorting out the mess and the muddle that Israel was in and putting the Gentiles firmly in their place. So Jesus had been doing this, but he'd been doing this in very different ways, maybe, from the ways people were expecting. He hadn't gathered an army. He hadn't announced any kind of um, program to topple the religious hierarchy. But he had been going around doing things that spoke powerfully of, of a, a new 
kind of kingdom, a new kind of life, a new kind of way of living, a new agenda, a healing energy sweeping through the land, bringing about a new state of affairs. And he'd been saying new things, sometimes puzzling things. But his disciples by this point had at least grasped the fact that yes, this was the true Messiah. And he was giving the dream of a Messiah maybe a bit of a facelift or a bit of a transformation. And so it is that Mark tells us, as soon as, as, soon as Peter makes this declaration, you are the Messiah, Mark tells us, Jesus begins to teach them. He begins to teach them a, a, a new thing. Because now they've reached a certain understanding, now they're ready for some fresh teaching. And it's tough stuff. The new lesson that Jesus wants to teach his disciples is that there isn't just danger ahead, but rather Jesus has to walk straight into that danger. He's not just talking about some kind of risky gamble that might just pay off. He's talking about certain death. This, Jesus says, is what he, the Messiah, must do. Well, you can imagine and you can sympathize with, with Peter's reaction. You might as well have had a football captain tell the team that he was intending to let the opposition score 10 goals right away. If you're an Ipswich fan, you might be familiar with that experience at the moment. Well, it's five goals anyway. Um, but anyway, uh, so I'm suddenly a tennis fan, like we all are. But this must have came as such a, uh, this must have come as such a shock to Peter and the rest. Why is the Messiah suddenly talking about losing, about defeat, about death? As Charlie Brown once said, winning ain't everything, but losing ain't anything. And Jesus seemed to be saying at this point, he was going to lose. He was going to be a loser. The Messiah was going to be a loser. And this is at the heart of what's going on here. And it explains uh, both the tricky language that Jesus uses and the strong negative reaction from Peter. Messiahs don't get killed by the authorities. A Messiah who did that would be shown up precisely as, well, a false Messiah. What on earth was Jesus saying? Well, we will get the explanation of this, as Peter and friends will, over the coming weeks as we continue our journey. But Jesus talks about the Son of Man. The Son of Man must have all of this happen to him before the Son of Man can come in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus is half quoting, half hinting at here, themes from uh, two of the great Old Testament prophets, Daniel and Zechariah. The Son of Man, particularly in Daniel chapter 7, represents God's people as they are suffering at the hands of pagan enemies. In that chapter, Daniel chapter 7, this Son of Man figure is eventually vindicated, but only after suffering, as God sets up the kingdom at last. And Jesus is warning his followers that this is how he understands his vocation. The vocation of the Messiah is the vocation of the Son of Man. The Son of Man must suffer before he is vindicated. And what is more, Jesus' friends, the Messiah's friends, the Son of Man's friends, must also follow in his footsteps. So important is this message, so important is his vocation, that when Peter protests, Jesus looks at him and calls him Satan. Because it's completely contrary to the way that Jesus is pursuing. 
Even Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, is capable of thinking in, in completely the wrong way at this point. He's not looking at things from God's point of view. He's looking at things from a human point of view. And this is a challenge to all of us. It's a challenge to the church in every generation as we struggle to think and to act according, from, according to God's point of view and not just a human point of view. God's understanding of, of success and, and glory and power are so utterly different from our own. All of our ideas of what these things look like are challenged and overturned. This is the revolution that Jesus comes to bring about and it's that revolution that continues today in the midst of every Christian community. So I'm just going to end with these words from Tom Wright. Jesus seems to think that evil is going to be defeated in his own lifetime, that the kingdom is going to come in his own lifetime, precisely through his own suffering and death. Why he thought that, and what it means for those who follow him, will become clear as we proceed. But this passage makes it clear that following Jesus is the only way to go. In fact, following Jesus is more or less Mark's definition of what being a Christian means. And Jesus is not leading us on a pleasant afternoon hike, but on a walk into danger and risk. Or did we suppose that the kingdom of God would merely mean a few minor adjustments in our ordinary lives. Amen.